This is the notice that the Minister of Lands and Forests signed on the 14th of January, 1985. Until further notice, the following portions of the former CNR rail line are closed to all vehicular traffic. Charlotte Street to the Islands Park Road, Arts Point Road near Birchtown to Gunning Cove Crossing, just out here. Port Saxon Crossing to the Port Clyde Crossing. And this fourth one has already been overtaken by events. We have a letter of authority to use that in guarantee. And it is signed on the 14th day of January 1985, Department of Lands and Forests, Honorable Ken Stretch, the Minister of Lands and Forests. That was, that was nearly 40 years ago. So we are going to request some changes to those notices. <laughs> Notice three says, Rail bed is closed to vehicular traffic from Port Saxon Crossing to Port Clyde Crossing near the Lyles Road. The rail bed is closed from Port Saxon Crossing to Port Clyde Crossing near Lyles Road. <coughs> we want to request that vehicular restriction be removed so that when that bridge is repaired, we can pass over that bridge and so that we can get off the public road and onto the trail. The next notice says that the rail bed is closed to vehicular traffic from Charlotte Street in Shelburne Town at the south end to the Islands Park Road. We're going to request the closure be removed between the Gills Point Road to Islands Park Road. We're not going to request any changes within the town of Shelby, but we're going to request that the vehicle restriction on the railhead be lifted between the Gills Point Road and Islands Park Road. <coughs> A trail use survey by the municipality of Shelburne three years ago already indicates that more than 50% of current OHV users, more than 50% of the users of that trail are OHV users, either from adjacent landowners or otherwise. This request is so as not to use the public road Highway 3 to get around Hearts Point. going all the way around Hearts Point from here to Birchtown, but somehow connecting to the rail bed going around Hearts Point. Using the rail bed instead to get around Hearts Point while achieving shared multi-use trail connectivity. The sixth request and the third Ministerial notice change that we would like to request is the notice two, which says vehicular traffic is restricted between Hearts Point Road near Birchtown and the Gunning Cove Crossing. All the way from Hearts Point Road, all the way down to outside the Spire Hall down here. We are going to request the closure be removed only from the Hearts Point Road to Boulder Cove Cottage. From, from there to the Boulder Cove Cottage Road. We are not requesting removal of that vehicular restriction from Boulder Cove Cottage down to Gunning Cove Crossing. <laughs> this is to minimize public road trail connecting Birch Town to Church Over, while avoiding many landowners in the Church Over and Gunning Cove area. This is needed to minimize the use of public roads while achieving safe trail connectivity. <coughs> okay, so that's second part again. Questions of clarification. Okay, so the ATV Club and the Trail Association 
are preparing to ask the Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources Minister and the ATV Association of Nova Scotia to progress our request through the government approval process. Usually it takes about a year, plus or minus six months, or a year or two, to get that permission to use Crown land. We're asking to use Crown land. Let me now mention some of the factors that have to be considered in trail development in this case. Safety of the road trail, trail connectivity, trail development of the Trans Canada Trail, adjacent landowners, users, recreation and tourism, economic impact, <clears throat> enforcement, funding, support and concerns of the community, and the community interest. Approval of these requests will give us a legal connected trail from Roseway River to Clyde River, completing the trail across Shelburne County as part of the Trans Canada Trail. Let's adapt to the state of affairs for the benefit of the community. Is it time to connect the trail by supporting these requests? Are the people represented here interested in further trail development? Please record your comments and support these requests. Thank you very much. We go, we're trying to have an interconnected trail network around the province, and we go from community to community. But I will say this, that in the areas where we have good community support, we do well. We're able to make those kind of connections, and we have some really good successes in the past decade, even moving forward with the Road Trails Act to enable us to use uh, parts of the road. We had really good community support to enable us to do that. That's a new thing for Nova Scotia. It's been in place in other jurisdictions, and it's always beneficial when the community supports. And I can tell you that one of our goals, like I said earlier, was to make an interconnected trail network around this province. We can't do it without the road trails. We can't do it without making these connections through communities, like here. But now you can take an ATV and ride on a trail or a public road from Digby all the way back around to where we going? Where are we going? Yeah. With this extension, you'll be able to move your way your way all the way up to Liverpool. We're working hard with the municipality. Uh, uh, Regional Queens, Queens Regional Municipality. And there's work ongoing. In fact, there were meetings last night. And then you can go from there all the way to Bridgewater. We're meeting with the municipality of Bridgewater shortly. And those connections alone will enable people to be able to come from the Coca-Cola bottling plant in Lakeside, Halifax, mm. all the way around the province back up to Digby. Another connection needs to be made there. Those are the kinds of connections that will enable us to take and have our responsible ATV years on a trail, going around the province, contributing more and more to our economy and to the communities. I think it's a good thing, and the only way it's going to happen is if people actually come out, fill out these forms, and express their interest in moving it forward. Thanks, Barry. Mm -hmm. Next comment, question. Anybody want something they'd like to share? Yes, sir. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> uh, we invited the town to this meeting. And unless I spilled some water on it, the, the representative from the town uh, at the last minute had another commitment, couldn't make it, but he sent me this comment that he was willing to say in public on behalf of the town. The proposed road for the town of Shelburne would be connected by a spa road, would be to connect the spa road with the existing Jordan River Trail. And he provided a little sketch map which shows that, I'm sorry this is so small, but got your imagination of Shelburne town. The Jordan Branch Trail, which we opened last year, uh, we built and operate and manage. It ends at Spa Road at the south end of town. And the town is examining coming up the Spa Road to King Street, going along King Street to the intersection of Water 
and going along Water Street to Falls Lane, coming out Falls Lane to the Roseway River. And they have authority, well, they don't have authority yet, but the Off-Highway Vehicle Road Trail Act gave the opportunity to municipalities to establish OHV roads through the municipalities. And so Shelburne Town is examining that. The, the final officer concludes by the town is in the process of drafting a bylaw to allow OHVs to use pro proposed streets. All, ve all motor vehicle rules apply to OHVs when traveling down the road. And excuse me a minute to get off track. Those OHV rules. <laughs> Here's a list of 19 of them. Of what, in order to use the OHV road trail, these were established during the trial, trial project. And if we want to discuss them, I'm sure Corey Robar and Eric uh, Rido could discuss them, but I'll leave that to the chair. These are the rules that you have to follow if you use the road trail. So uh, we won't pass that around because we need that copy. But if at the end you want to come up and see the map so you can see it, Sherm has it, you can take a look at that. Yeah. And the bylaw officer says, if you want to discuss it, any questions, please contact Dana Nash, Town of Shelburne Bylaw Enforcement Officer. Yeah. So other statements, questions? Yes. Can you go over a little bit about the maintenance? Like once you get approval, because some of the parts, especially then here, they're going to need to be fixed up and so just to repeat, just for that to note, your voice is quieter. It's okay. I'm gonna be louder. It's okay. <laughs> what, they're, what they're asking about is maintenance and the fact that some parts of the trail are in not great shape and need to be maintained and will need to be maintained. So Sharon, what are you talk about trail maintenance a bit? Our current trails are maintained with funds and grants from off highway vehicle infrastructure fund from community cultures and heritage recreation trail expansion program from fundraising by club members uh, by memberships by club members and by contribution grant contributions from the municipalities we spend all the money that we can get on our existing maintenance trails we are asking for uh, connectivity on dnr managed Rail bed. Those those rail beds will be managed as they are now by DNR. We we don't have the funds to manage them, so they're DNR. Okay. So you don't plan on doing any development or management of the trails that you are presenting here tonight, opening up. Is that correct? They're going to be as is at this time. So you're not planning to apply for the letter of authority to actually take over ownership of those trails to be able to do that maintenance and development. We are not applying for letter of authority. We're applying for trail connectivity. After, when we achieve trail connectivity, we'll see what community group, uh, what municipality wants to continue the development of the trail to a shared multi-use trail. Other questions, comments? Going one. Yes, yes, sir. Question uh, on the Birch Bank in between the uh, Old Cove and the Black Church, I have to use that as long as you get a wood and no, still alive. The central material old railroad. That's not, you know, it, we are not restricting access on the trip. You can continue to use that. We have sections of trail under LOA and there's a section of PNR rail bed that is used as driveways and woods access roads. So this gentleman had asked about could he continue to get, bring wood up on one of the sections? And yes. Perhaps, uh, I don't know if that's an adequate answer or is that a thorough enough answer, Corey? Uh, Corey if, if it's the road trail, the road would remain as a road. The only thing is that we would be permitted to use that road. But everybody else who used it before can continue to use it. 
That's right. It still yeah. remains as a road. Yes. Sir. Other folks, questions? <laughs> that notice has been in place for 40 years. And 40. no community grew. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. For 40 years. And no community group has asked for changes that I'm aware of, although there are. There have been some community groups that could have. Uh, there's been no walker group, bicycle groups, or other group that has in that 40 years. Um, I just got distracted from your question. What happens if we don't uh, get with you? Well, maybe we wait another 40 years. <laughs> what, I'm, what I raised in my comments was that off-highway vehicles are here. They're not going away. They're part of the community. Nobody is happy with the situation, either trail users or some adjacent landowners, we're trying to adapt the situation to get some satisfaction among all these groups, develop the community, respect among the community, make it easier to have enforcement, to make this legal, accessible, to make it part of the Trans Canada Trail, part of tourism development, um, develop the community, respect in the community, I might be dreaming pipe dreams, but let's work together. Does that answer your question, sir? <laughs> until you get, or until you don't get what you want. Another thing. One of the hours, the long nights, I'll live right next to the track. They want to go four wheel haul. So the gentleman's asking about hours of use and restriction. <laughs> Basically, um, the Off-Highway Vehicle Road Trail Act delineates the regulations that you have to follow to use the road trail. One of the key ones is that it's on approved roads only. Drivers must hold a driver's license. Currently, the approved public road speed is 25 kilometers an hour. Um, public road trail is open for use only between a half hour before dawn and a half hour after dusk, just like some hunting regulations. Jerry, anything you want to add? He just said what I would say. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> there was a lady here that wanted a copy of this. Uh... Yes, sir. Yeah, no property. It's on that old road. Right now, back to old road. Well, I'm going to get most back here. I can't do a certain hour with that driveway. No, only if you're on an ATV. Oh, on your, if you're on an ATV. Those are the ATV rules. Okay. OK, good question. No. <laughs> Other folks with questions or thoughts? Here, I use the old railroad day to go up. Sometimes I don't get out there until an hour after that. I'm going to get fine if I get stopped on the I. Yeah, that's a technicality. That's a technicality that is up to the enforcement officer. And if we have reasonable enforcement officers, they'll come out to chase down abusers and violators as soon as we call them. Report, report, report violations. But they also use their judgment. Is something really illegal going on here or going on? So we trust and hope that our police officers are our CMP and our natural resources are, are reasonable people. If you're shooting your gun at the same time, hey, we don't we don't uh, we don't condone illegality in any way. If you encounter illegality, report. My name is Laura Barcos. I'm the chair of the No Special Trails Federation. We're an umbrella trail organization that encompasses membership from about 120 volunteer organizations just like this one. Um, as well as associate memberships from all across Nova Scotia. That includes equestrians, cyclists, canoe kayakers on, on trails that are on the water, it includes the OHV community that is um, snowmobile, off-road motorcycle, and ATVs, um, bicycles, did I already mention those? Um, we are working very, very hard to um, get this, this We Share Trails You'll see the piece of back there that Afghan has brought along in, a, in partnership and to launch our, our etiquette program to ensure that people know
how to use the trails in a respectful way, regardless of whether you're on four, four hooves or walking your dog on a leash and, and you know, how messes sometimes <laughs> that dogs leave. That's probably one of the biggest complaints that I had in my almost 22 years as a trails and open space coordinator in the district of Lunenburg was, was dog feces along the trail, dog owners not picking up. But um, to, the, to the point, Sherm, I think it's, you said it already, that um, you have to respect other users. Uh, I heard it best said once at a public meeting where it was stated that it's everybody wins and everybody gets something rather than one person or one group or one organization or one part of the community not getting anything. And if we, if we, if we continue to share our trails as we have in other parts of the province, with to great success, there's absolutely no reason that we can't overcome the the individual problems that happen with better enforcement and ensuring that we have this open communication opportunity that groups, very hardworking groups like Germs here is working to ensure that everybody gets the opportunity to, to say their piece. And we do it right across the province. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Owns the old rail bed. Is that the municipalities or is that DNR? I'll turn to you in a moment, Corey. Uh, the rail bed, the core rail bed given by CNR is owned by the province. <laughs> there are some spur lines that are owned by the municipality. Some portion of the spur lines have been sold to adjacent landowners. Um, and that's especially true around the Walk Court area. Uh, the rail bed that we're talking about, to the best of our knowledge, and we haven't been informed otherwise by DNR or anybody else, is crown land owned by the province. So all through this area is all crown land? The saying. rail bed the rail through bed. this area yeah. is crown land owned by the province, managed by natural resources. Thank you. Curry, Curry perhaps for people who don't know, what's a spur line? Uh, perhaps. Curry, who, you, who are you? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, Curry Robart, the Trails and OHV Program Officer with Community Culture Support and Heritage. So, uh, under my job description program, uh, the abandoned rail bed is under that. So, uh, yeah, the, the majority of the rail bed is owned by DNR. There are some variable sections around the province, but 95% of it is owned by DNR. But what's a spur line? Just a spur line, line we know. Just, uh, uh, just a line that, say, might have went off to the fish land or might have went off to uh, a quarry or something like that somewhere. Right? So, just where we look at specific ones, like maybe to a mill or something like that. Something one like that. specific one is uh, from Allendale to Lockwood. Mm -hmm. Great. Great to have an example too. That was taken over by the municipality shop. Okay. Through the open trails, is there any, and I know there's no accurate way, but rough idea. I know there's no statistics, but more than one. What would the guesstimate be on uh, traffic? I know different days, weekends going to be busy or not, but any idea? The uh, the uh, municipality of District Shelburne, I think, uh, completed a report about February 2021 with trail use counts on three of the trails that the municipality operates. Uh, is uh, Adam Dedrick here? No. He, he, uh, he has that report, and you can find those numbers in that report. The, the number that I pulled out from that uh, for this presentation tonight uh, was that there, were, uh, there is a means to accurately count trail traffic. It can determine the difference between walkers, bicyclers, and OHV vehicles. It records time of day um, and number count of each type. And uh, Adam has those numbers in that report for a number of the trails in the municipality of Shelburne, including uh, the Roseway River Trail. And the number that I pulled out for tonight was the one that I was curious about, just like you're curious, was that the 50% uh, of the, or more, 
of the users of the uh, Roseway River Trail were OHV riders uh, going on that trail, either as adjacent landowners or uh, past the barriers. Uh, Laura, sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay. May I just speak to that briefly, Sharon? Um, they're in the Drum Runners Trail, that's from um, Halifax to Lunenburg. We actually used the, that trail counting system a, a number of times over a period of a couple of years once the trail was developed. And we had data that we had used before the trail got upgraded. And what we found is before the trails were upgraded, um, what we had were primarily OHV operators because it wasn't a nice place to walk. It wasn't a nice or a safe place to take a horse or you couldn't certainly ride your bicycle on any kind of surface. Um, so what we found after the fact, when the counts were done after the trails were developed and actually became trails, because what we're talking about is an unmanaged, unmaintained route compared to a finished trail. And what we found is the only uses that increased were significantly were the walkers and the cyclists that that increased on the use once the trail was created and developed and maintained in such a way that other users could actually have safe access to it. How long did that take that change? How long, how long did, that did that change take? How did that how long did that take? Almost immediate. Once the trail was surfaced, once it became a trail right. and it wasn't just a route, an unmaintained folks that's Again, just keep the conversation down other than people who are speaking. Once the trail was developed and became and became a trail with signage and rules and all of that, um, the, the change was almost immediate because before you couldn't walk in sections of it because there was you know the large stones or it was very pitted. You certainly couldn't take a bicycle because bicycles require the highest level of trail service in order to operate. And we found almost immediately the only the only users that that um, increased were walkers and cyclists. And okay. so it took as long as it took us to develop that trail section. <laughs> and so how long? My question was, how long did that transition take from rock trail for OHV? It all depends. Oh, all kinds of different trails. It all depends on the community support. It depends on the finances that are available and how how involved the community is in the volunteer group. And uh, we've had really great success with that, of providing places where people can go walk and cycling or take their horses in an, in an area or on a, on a route that they could never use before. I think it also depends on how much work has to be done to upgrade right. the trail in terms of vehicles <coughs> and stuff like that. Absolutely. That's been a huge issue for time. Again, questions or comments, folks? tonight as part of our application so that the bureaucrats have assessed the approval or acceptance or analysis of all the information that we collect tonight. Um, it is part, we will write up a synopsis of this meeting. Uh, the comment form that you're holding indicates some of the answers that we hope to get. Uh, are they adjacent landowners? Are they in from the municipality? Um, and their concerns and so we will data sheet, we'll spreadsheet flood information and include it with the application process. Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. Chair, we might get some comments on the application. Sure, and I think, what, process. I think what the participant was also asking is how could participants see the results of tonight? Absolutely. How is that going to happen? I'm uh, Eric Ryder, I'm the Trails Coordinator for Advance. Uh, I submit the applications to Department of Public Works for the road trail application. Uh, I get the information from, or an application from uh, the local trail association, this case, and, but those comment sheets, uh, I'll take those and uh, we'll make sure to do a synopsis up. The number of people, number of comments we had, number of sheets filled out, who was in favor, who was not in favor, a little bit of information about if we have it, what area you came from, what your interest is in your trails, and we <coughs> submit that as a synopsis, as a report to Public Works as part of the application as one of the requirements. I imagine it's a similar process for uh, for a letter of authority or get this change in application done for the, uh, the rail bed. Those <coughs> sheets themselves, uh, I will have a photocopy of those and we'll scan them in a the Public Works as evidence. 
But the sheets themselves won't be shared with the public uh, as a rule, so they won't really know your name or anything on those. But I would imagine that uh, Sherman will can make uh, synopsis of what we found here and the results of the meeting, how many people were in favor of how many weren't, and some of the comments. So I, I imagine we'll probably come up with that you know, in, in the near future. So that could be posted on the website? So that we, we, we could. Uh, you can also attend their club meetings and we'll share it there. <laughs> but I think, I mean, the, the, the part of the question is how do people from here find out? Is there a way that they can access that? Uh, I'll put the synopsis together and I'll make the synopsis available for our application. And then after the application is in, I'll make the synopsis available to you, whoever asks, Lisa. Okay. Great. But I you also have the last page point here that, uh, uh, is uh, yes. we're not going to attach names to the comments. That's not my question. I just want to know the results. Yep. And sure. that can be shared on your public Facebook page that you do have for your association. Okay. Uh, there was a gentleman who put this hand. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. My name is Dave White. I'm the secretary of the Queens County Marist of Trails Group and the president of the Queens County ATV Association. We're doing similar work in our area. Um, Sherman and his group are, are some of the people who have been informing what we're doing. And it's very important to me to establish these connections. As the sure mentioned, when we had fire down here, these trails help people get in and fight them fires. The better shape them trails are in, the better shape our firefighters are in. And the better routes we get around to get our communities. The other big thing for me is that economic driver. This isn't my hometown. And where I'm working for this in my hometown isn't where I live anymore. But I've seen the impact that this can have on your local businesses. This isn't 1983 where we're talking about $600 three-wheelers anymore. <laughs> a new side by side, $50,000. People aren't going to do something that's going to get that taken away from them. So there might be somebody that needs a reminder from the authorities, and we encourage you to call. <laughs> but by and large, users are looking for this connectivity, and they want to have this economic impact. There's a study available to you, $454 million went into our economy in 2022 from these machines. And I can't tell you, I can't wait for that connection so I can come down and do my trip. And there's nothing better than I'd like to be able to take some people through at a reasonable time of day, <laughs> use the hotels, use your restaurants and support you. And the best thing I can hope for is that all of you want to come up and do the same thing in my county because We've got to start to support each other, and I think that's the best way forward. Somebody asked about what happens if you don't get it. Right now, I think I might be, we might be the group that's the furthest ahead working on the railways, and that actually went to the DNR's legal department today. So we've been working with them for about eight months, and it looks fairly positive. Nobody's making any promises, because everybody wants to check into things. But when this went through the legislature, there you were there. I don't believe there was any dissenting votes provincially. So people believe that we can do this, and the reason they believe it is because we're Nova Scotians. We'll work together, and if there's somebody we got to tell in the line, we'll do it just like we do any other time. Great. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. What's going to be the width of the barricades? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the width of the barricades. Um, I want to know what kind of side-by-side to buy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just, just as a background, uh, I've only been in this position for two years. Before that, uh, I used to be in Eric's position, so I used to be the sales coordinator for that band. I will tell you this that in 2015 there was a ministerial letter that stated that the gates and barriers and the maximum width of machine permitted on the trails was 60 inches. Um, the gate and barrier width was changed to 66 inches because after three years it was figured out that you couldn't get a 60 inch machine through a 60 inch gate opening. <laughs> I am uh, I'm chairing a working group and we're actually looking at the gate and barrier widths and that kind of stuff, recognizing that um, the size of the side-by-sides have been changing. 
I will tell you this, that if there was a judicial review done when originally they said 60 inches and they looked at jurisdictions like Quebec and Ontario where they have major OHV infrastructure in place and a major trail system. Um, those locations at that time was maximum 60 inches with the same trail standard for width and stuff. Um, since then, those jurisdictions have changed and Quebec and Ontario now are maximum of 65 inches. So that's part of what the working group has looked at is, you know, the, the previous working group looked at what was done in other jurisdictions. Our new working group is, what, is looking at what has changed in those same jurisdictions, right? So, uh, yeah, there's, and Eric sits on the working group, so there is a push for um, a wider, the ability to have a wider uh, machine on the trails type thing, taking into account that the trails are only so wide for infrastructure-wise type of thing, right? So the, the surface is only so wide. So the standard's 137 inches, so it's hard to have two machines at 70 inches wide pass each other. Mm -hmm. and if the trail's only 137 inches wide, 70 and 70 was 140 when I went to school, which is many years ago, <laughs> but it's still wider than what the 137 inches is, right? So it doesn't really work, right? So there's a liability factor. Uh, and the recommendations all have to be reviewed, of course, for liability and stuff like that, because the province is actually the landowner. So the firm has a we are looking at with the machines and what's from there. The firm yeah. has a common with Oh, well, yeah, and we're just talking Yeah, we're just talking about the road. Well, I'm not talking about the government road. I'm just talking about the rail yeah. so. In Shelburne County, most of our uh, barriers and bridges uh, are built to the DNR trail construction standards. Um, depending on when we got the letter of authority, the letter of authority told us what size to make those barriers. Uh, currently, Borden, you can correct me, I believe all of our uh, barriers are 72 inches. 72, except we have about three, four, we built 22 bridges, four of them in East Jordan. 24, 24 yeah, we've done the lately. <laughs> 24 bridges, uh, and there are about four in East Jordan that are 66 inches wide. Uh, we haven't yet put up the signs at the ends of the trail warning riders that the trail only allows vehicles that width. Uh, but we'll get that information out. Like tonight um, we will not widen those bridges until they're due for uh, refurbishment or renewal um, I don't know if this is a joke or not but you don't buy a fridge too big for your <laughs> kitchen so if you know what you're going to use your wheeler for or your side-by-side -side for or your vehicle for you buy the right vehicle for where you're using it. You don't buy a truck too big for what you're going to use it. You don't buy an OHV too big for where you're going to use it. So. I mean, the trail up for fire truck, so you may have to use and all that. Yes. A fire truck and then ambulance is not 66 inches, it's like a Do you have an answer to that question, sir? The rail bits. The, the way the gates are set, those are rules for off-highway vehicles. So, for instance, when you have some of those cases of fires and stuff, um, those regulations are for the off-highway vehicles. If you have an emergency vehicle that's got to get in there and they figure they can access it, I can tell you from experience, they're gone. But those bridges were built a long time ago. And I'm not talking the bridges, I'm talking the rocks. That they put the down. barriers, those barriers follow <laughs> DNR recommendations, and as Corey mentioned, and, to, and uh, the last letter that came out was 2018, and that gave five years for those to be moved. And that was the increase of up to the 66 inches, and like I said, that worker group's looking after that. Um, our area isn't quite as generous as theirs. Most of Queens County, we try and, sorry, South Queens, we've got ours set at 70 inches. It's a different, different group in the north end of the county. They're a little bit different up there. When you travel into Lunenburg County, again, it's a little bit, bit different, 66 inches. They're not being maintained for the fire trucks. 
I do know in North Queens, when they set their gates, that they had their volunteer fire department. They've got a new side-by-side -side that's a rescue vehicle. They had them come out and run it through all their gates to double check. The groups aren't set in wits, provinces. And the provincial employees, if they've got to operate that group gear, they're going to make those decisions. And like I said, in here, we know that they used fire roads and they used driveways. They used anywhere they could get in there because they did what they had to do. We're not necessarily building it for that purpose. We're building it for connectivity, economic impact, and all trail users. But when it comes to emergency, I tell you, I'd rather have something than nothing. Okay, folks, we're almost out of time. Anybody with last minute thoughts they want to share? Okay, not seeing anybody. Uh, first off, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and participating. This is a huge turnout on a really crappy evening, and so this is really, really valuable. Um, a huge amount of volunteer time and work went in to getting displays, preparing everything, and so on. And so there are lots of volunteers in the room who helped work that, but I really like a round of applause for those who did that. Corey came out, Laura came out, other folks did, folks from Outbands. So again, really appreciate everybody coming, coming together and listening and hearing. The most important thing you can do before you leave, are you tired of this yet? Um, please fill out the form and leave your thoughts and leave it in the, uh, the bucket. Um, we'll stay around for a few minutes. Um, if people have other questions, they want to ask one on one. Other than that, again, thank you so much. This was amazing. One of the best ones we have done. It is still nasty out. Please be careful driving home. There is water pool in the roadways. You may have to lane. Take your time. Be safe. Thanks again.